Welcome, adventurers. This week's episode starts a little differently with a conversation. My buddy Tracy and I were talking about how interesting it would be to have cliff faces, specifically basalt rock columnar cliff faces. They're so cool, I couldn't resist. So I got my materials, and I got into it. It's going to be 20 inches tall by 15 inches wide. It's huge. It's quite literally the biggest set piece I've made for gaming. But I figure a rock cliff needs to be pretty amazing, tall, imposing, and of course playable. Now that we've got the backdrop for the cliffs to attach to, we need something for it to stabilize the base. So I make something that's 15 inches wide by about 10 inches deep. And ultimately the vertical surface will be mounted in the center of this. So that there's about 7 or so inches on each side that I can build upon. Now, columnar basalt rock cliffs are this week. If you want to see what I do with the backside, check out next week's video. Here I trim off the edges as you've seen me do in other videos. So that way it kind of slopes down to meet the table more naturally. I'm just double checking that the edges look good here. And once I'm sure of that, I'm going to lay out the bulk of the cliffs. Now, I'm going to be using foam to do this, so I don't want to use a ton of foam, so I'm going to build sort of a cardboard armature that the foam will attach to. And that's what these boxes are for. The shorter one, I determined is too thick, so I'm going to cut it in half depth-wise, so it's about half as thick as it is here. And that's what I'm going to do now. Once I've done that, I'm laying it out and realize that it's a little too wide, so I'm going to notch a more rectangular box so that one can slot into the other. And see how I use very precise measuring by holding one to the next and then kind of pushing it in and trimming off pieces until it fits properly, or at least properly as I want it. Now determine where exactly I want the bulk of this to be, and sketch it out around, and of course our friend Hot Glue holds it all together. As you can see, I've used no real special tools or anything, and you could use PVA glue to do this as well. Uh, I just happen to have hot glue, and it's faster. Now once I'm satisfied with that, I determine which side of the base I want to be the front for this face. Once that's decided, more hot glue, and the two pieces become one. Just like that. Very simple. Anybody can do this. Even me, apparently. So now I've uh, examined it, I need to make columnar basalt. Now I decided to just make one inch by one inch rectangles. Now I could cut them all by hand, as you can see here, but I've got a hot wire cutter and I'm definitely going to batch this work so that it's a lot faster. So I knock a whole bunch out and figure out how I want my hexagonal columnar basalt to be. So I set an angle, match my depth, and cut off and repeat until that whole pile becomes hexagonal rods. Without uh, a hot wire cutter, this would take a lot longer, but it can be done, and maybe not as ambitiously as me. Now I've got a variety of these pieces. We're going to texture them. My texture roller finally died after two years. Apparently, uh, we couldn't handle being used to make so many rocky columns. Now, I don't texture all six sides of these while I'm doing that. I only texture the side on all of them that faces out, and later will texture only sides that are additionally exposed so that I'm not using a ton of time to do this, because there's no sense in texturing everything when it won't even be seen. Those are little hints to make sure that your crafting doesn't drive you insane. Don't waste time if you don't have to. So here I'm trying to figure out how I want to lay these out and determine that if I snap them they give a real natural rocky end appearance. And I can snap them to about where I want. I can cut them off very easily to make them very flush. And I'm just trying to figure out how I want to lay out this pattern. Because we've got some options here. Now here I took and broke a whole bunch in half and cut so that it has a smooth flat side. 
using the box as a guide, I decide where I want to lay my first piece, as you see here, and then lay out a row. Pretty basic, simple, and I start trying to piece other pieces against that as building blocks, and realize that by doing what I did, by leaving those first small pieces whole, I've made it too wide. I'm really going to realize that here in just a minute or so, once I stand it upright and see that, well, the whole thing's supposed to be playable, and this isn't. So sometimes, you're just going to tear it all off and start again. And I did. So I cut them in half, lay them out in the same pattern, and now, when I build onto them, I actually have playable space as I go forward. I know. You watch these videos to learn something. Well, you learn today that you're going to make mistakes. And I hope my other videos and this one help reinforce that once you do, you can still recover from it like this. Now that I have playable terrain, I need to make it protected. Let's just make sure that I spend too much time playing with my little toy soldiers on it before I do that. Yep, I can definitely put places, uh, pieces a lot of places on this. Maybe not all the places. So black paint and Mod Podge with a little bit of water is going to cover the entire thing and protect it from the spray paint I'm going to use to prime it. And this time, it doesn't melt. I know. I can learn. So as I finish this up, take it outside, hit it with a black base coat all over, very thoroughly, and then I'm going to hit it with a Zenithal highlight and spray it from above with a matte gray. Uh, I'm using Rust-Oleum here, but you could use whatever you have as long as you protect it. Now you can see the Zenithal definitely brings out the various nooks and crannies while leaving the dark recesses, which makes it really neat. I've always liked this practice of Zenithal highlighting, and I'm going to use it to my greatest effect when I actually paint this thoroughly in a little bit. So, now that I'm satisfied that it didn't melt or do anything weird and still play with my little toy soldiers for a little while, I, uh, I'm going to actually proceed to painting this. Now, I had a lot of trouble deciding what to do, and I didn't want to make everything just weird and the same all the time. So, I kept thinking about it. And while I was thinking about it, I figured I would do the basing sludge. The basing sludge is just going to tie the top to the bottom and fill in any weird gaps that I felt like might need some stuff here, including putting a bit of texture on the backdrop where it's exposed. And I've got a few extra pieces here and an extra piece of offcut from when I made the uh, fortress build. With those, I'm going to take and break some off, figure out how to put them on here for some scatter terrain. Very simple. Also, my basing technique of PVA glue, a little water in it, put some sand down. As you see here, finish that up, seal it all in after I put some piles of rocks here and there. And the seal is two parts water, one part uh, Eileen's tacky glue in this case. Make sure it's all sealed down, let it dry. And while it's drying, I'm going to start painting massive columns here. Now, I use a little mixing cup that I got at Michael's, uh, some airbrush thinner. I've got an Iwata Eclipse, I believe it is. I'm no airbrush expert, but I find that it does expedite these larger paint jobs a great deal. Now, I've mixed my paint with the Vortex mixer there, thinking it was too thick, and then disaster. Uh, apparently the tip was clogged, not the paint being too thick. So while I clean that up, I'm going to take this opportunity to remind you to like the video. Please subscribe and hit the notification so you can see my next major mistake. Now back to painting. The benefit of this is I noticed that the color was a bit too bright and I wanted it to be a bit darker to make these tower columns look more ominous. So. Seeing that it was too light, I switched to a darker green, mixed that up in roughly a 2 to 1 ratio of thinner to paint, and begin painting dark green from the bottom up, as you see here. And then that lighter green, I'm actually going to use to paint 
from the top down in a Zenithal highlight as well. And since it's thin, the true Zenithal paint and base coat I put on before still shine through to give it true depth. So it's lighter at the top, darker at the bottom, and actually has a gradual change in color from top to bottom. I'll repeat this same paint job for the scatter terrain I made with the extra pieces. Just like you see here. Also, how small my workspace is. So, I find this kind of limey green, I think it's like a snake scale color or slime green. And then, as I'm getting into dry brushing this, I found that I had a cheap bottle of paint that was the exact same color. So I switched to that for sure. Of course, before I do my wash with aged pepperoncinis, I put on a clear matte varnish so that way it would run smoothly across the surface. I'll let that dry, and now you can see the finished product. To be fair, I'm still working on my lighting skills, but I think you get the gist. Ultimately, I'm very happy with the way this turned out, even though these pictures I don't think feel I don't feel, rather, that they present the best image of this. But the cliffs are certainly green and have a wonderful gradient from top to bottom of light to dark, definitely giving them an ominous feel as you look up to this massive cliff. Well, thank you for watching. I'll go have an adventure in crafting.